In a statement released today, Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis confirmed that her 80-year-old aunt, Mrs. Edith Bouvier Beale, and her adult daughter, Edie, are living in squalid conditions in an East Hampton estate known as Gray Gardens. Edith and Edie are members of the Bouvier family who is Jackie Bouvier Kennedy. So it's really a part of an American royalty. The women at the time were certainly bred to marry into wealth, into um, nobility. From the day of their um, coming out party, it was, it was just assumed that they would be taken care of for the rest of their lives. And when that didn't happen for these two women, they got left behind by the social register. Those of us who uh, really remember the Kennedys, we think of that as an idyllic time period, that America was in full bloom. It was like Camelot. It was a dream come true. We never considered that there were other people involved with that very same clan that had absolutely nothing. The musical gives you a background on particularly these two women who, one is a debutante who's just about to uh, join high society, and the other is her mother who is right in the flow of everything that was going on in New York in the 1940s. And then to see them 30 years later in the 1970s, how their life has completely disintegrated around them just in the same way their home has disintegrated. I was absolutely involved with the documentary. I couldn't believe that these women allowed themselves to be so exposed. You can't distance yourself too much from it as you watch it. And that's in, in part largely due to the, the Maisels, the documentary filmmakers. They're trying to show people what, what these human beings were. They weren't just headlines and tabloid fodder as people might like to see them as, and which is something we need to remember today in all of our entertainment, which is news. So uh, I think it's very apropos for now when we're so starved for our own royalty or celebrity, and, but at the same point seeing the human side of them. And um, you, you, you fall in love with these imperfect people. I have to get my voice exactly back the way it was when I was 45 years old. You can't, Mother Oh, yes, I can. Oh, Something yes. happens, let's face it. I never it. strain my voice. Never no, but my life. I strain my voice. I always think with music, even if you don't have the words, you should be able to tell something about the character. And this is one of those musicals where you really get that sense. And you get a time placement as it moves from, was it 1941 we have in the first act, and 1975 in the second act. You get a great description orally about where you are with the music, but also the lyrics and the book have a great placement and a great intimacy. The first act is so interesting because there are these wonderful little set pieces which set us in time. And um, Big Edie at that time was very interested in a musical career and she had an accompanist. And when this accompanist plays and she sings, we are really transported to the time of Noel Coward or Cole Porter. And these pieces evoke that time, even though they're absolutely brand new. And some of them, of course, while sounding like something you may have heard before, really put the plot forward, like two peas in a pod. The second act was absolutely surprising because it was very much a musical version of the documentary film. I mean, these women literally allowed the filmmakers to come into their house and capture them utterly spontaneously. And the play captures that. The songs seem as if they popped out of the minds of Edie, uh, Little Edie, when in the 1970s. It's someone who is rebelling against the establishment. It's not rock and roll. But at the same time, it is a rebellion against classic musical comedy songs. You would think that someone who has everything, there's a song in the show called The Girl Who Has Everything, uh, would be content and would be free to be whoever they wanted to be. But in fact, these women became something completely different and actually became freer and prouder. Uh, in some ways, their own um, lives became works of art. Instead of supporting artists, they actually became the artists, and their lives became their work of art. Edie's fashion sense is a thing of beauty. It's astounding. It's a perfect blend of serious and fanciful, and little Edie as a person had that kind of cult following, and no wonder they were in the tabloids. And 
uh, people were interested in them and how it spurred on this sense of the fashion world where she almost became a muse and an interest because some of it is just fashion, some of it is psychology, some of it is emotion and she used all of that in what she was wearing and doing and trying to reclaim from her past. Edie's fashion, which, is, which became quite in vogue after the, the documentary came out, was really based on the fact because they, they could buy no more clothes. So she would take all of her old clothes and like an old skirt that she could no longer wear, she would turn upside down and wear the, the, uh, the skirt bottom part up at the waist and then the, the waist would come all the way down so it became very chic. You know, old turtlenecks became turbans and whatever else. So like they were really, I felt creative in their limitations financially. Um, they pretty much lived on ice cream and liver pate. Oh, and corn on the cob, of course. To the day they died, they really said their life was beautiful. When, when you look at it, it looks nothing but um, horror with Don't cat food it. cans everywhere and trash and, and <laughs> completely living in squalor. They still said that they were artists and they were still living in beauty. We as humans have those, have those poles inside of us and those, those polar opposites where what you want and what you need to do and what you feel you have to do don't always coincide and in this show you get to see some some amazing ways how how those things don't always coincide and how they do i think i would bring anyone who has a, an Im imagination about art artistry and what art can do because i think this piece is moving in the last analysis it is engaging it is certainly funny but it is moving because it comes from a reality and a deep place about the spirits of these women. It is a stellar cast of Twin Cities performers. We have pulled together a group of people that are at the top of their games and really perfect for these roles. I come from a large family and, and I understand also on Little Edie's perspective that idea of wanting to break out and be who you are or be more than what the family name is. I think the rehearsals will be very exciting to watch what each person has to bring. But then, of course, we always go back to we've got the pictures, we've got the sounds, we've got the moments and the moments that are referred to. Kate Sutton Johnson uh, is a set designer. She won the uh, Ivy Award for um, emerging artist uh, two years ago and she really has a very distinctive eye and she thinks like a director so working with her on this project has been fascinating because she comes in with ideas that James and I would normally come in with. We all felt that the, the material really was about these women and the house you know being that the, the name of the show is the actual name of the house the house really played an important part so we tried to set it in the house in one place and we really wanted to make it like where we focused in the house and then let it be all about the characters. I would want to see this musical if I did not know it just because it is so unusual. It deals with unusual themes. You, you don't think that you're going to go and see huge chorus lines of people dressed all alike or, or all the songs that you know. I think it's a challenge to go and see something, especially when it seems to deal with something that is so unique. But I'm so glad that this piece is having a life.